to some of their work on our website, www.onlinelearninglegends.com. I'm Mark Nichols, the interviewer in this episode. You'll meet Associate Professor Michael Barber in this episode. Michael is a researcher of instructional design and online distance education for the K-12 sector, based at Turo University in California. His advocacy for and scholarship in online K-12 education demonstrated as a model whose time has come. I'm talking with Michael Barber, who is currently an Associate Professor of Instructional Design for the College of Education and Health Services at Tauro University, California. Michael's career in instructional design includes several initiatives supporting online education in K-12 contexts. Uh, Michael, it's great to be talking with you. Likewise, Mark. Can we start with a brief overview of your career and publications? Uh, I had the, the good fortune, or uh, at the time when you know, you're know you a fledgling doc student, it seemed like the misfortune um, of being one of the, the first folks that were looking at the, the area of K-12 online learning. Uh, while K-12 distance learning had been around for well, almost a century when I had started, and, and there had been a wealth of, of research um, into sort of the legacy models, correspondence, educational radio, um, telematics, and, and so forth, um, there were probably only five or six folks involved in, in K-12 online learning when I first started writing about it back in I think I published my first article on it in like 99 or 98, maybe. Yep. Um, I know that I first became aware of it in 97 when I was um, following a project that was going in my home province of, of Newfoundland that was actually being led by a, a, a fellow Kiwi, uh, Ken Stevens at the time. Mm -hmm. He was working yep. at Memorial University. And really, it's it's been sort of the, the sole or singular focus of, of my academic work uh, so all throughout my, my doctoral degree, and I was fortunate to go to a university that focused primarily upon training folks that were going to end up in research universities. They essentially wanted to train uh, folks that would look like them at the University of Georgia. And uh, so I had the opportunity to do a lot of writing uh, back then. In fact, um, one of the articles that I, I, I published out of my uh, dissertation is still my, my most cited article. It was a literature review that was published back in uh, 2009 by Computers and Education, yeah. uh, and um, you know I spent six years at Wayne State University and continued to work in this area. And uh, while I was there, I was fortunate that the um, Michigan, where Wayne State was located, was the first state in the U.S. that actually required students to have an online learning experience in order to graduate mm -hmm. from high mm -hmm. school. So it put a, an additional focus upon. Uh, the work that I was doing and, and provided a lot of opportunity to engage with with practitioners in that research. You know, and then a few years at uh, Sacred Heart in, in the Northeast in, in Connecticut, and I've been, well, I'm in my sixth year now at Toro University here in California. And uh, like many people in the field over the last couple of years, I've really been focused upon uh, looking at what's been happening in terms of the the use of distance learning as a means to uh, provide some sort of continuity of learning for students and um, uh, how we can sort of distinguish this emergency remote learning that we saw initially and then some of the planned or in some cases unplanned remote learning that's been taking place and and how that's different from these traditional online learning programs that we've been looking at for the last three decades. Can I unpick that a little bit with you, Michael? So you've used online and distance almost as synonyms, and then you've also injected emergency remote teaching. Can you talk a bit about the relationship across those things? Uh, certainly. So online learning for me is basically a type of distance learning. Um, so distance learning, I think, is more of a, a, an all-encompassing term, if you will. Um, and uh, online just refers to the specific distance medium that we're using at the moment, or that's, I guess, the majority at the moment. And I say the majority at the moment because it's actually quite fascinating that over the past two years, as the pandemic has unfolded, the jurisdictions that had, were able to rely the least or rely less on online forms of distance education, uh, those that still had robust uh, what we would call legacy mediums. Uh, New Zealand is actually a great example of this. You, you've got the correspondence school down there, Takora, yeah. that has been operating now for, I think this year is actually its 100th anniversary. And um, the ability for that to fill in the gaps that we've seen around the digital divide uh, 
um, has really allowed New Zealand to um, be, in my opinion, one of the, the leaders in terms of the remote learning that's happening. And that's the third term you asked about, that emergency remote or remote learning. Um, and the main difference, I think, between that and a traditional or established distance or online learning program is the idea that remote learning is designed to be temporary in nature. Uh, so it's what we do when we can't have folks in the classroom, but as soon as we can bring them back to an in-person context, we plan on doing that. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't online learning programs that are operating right now. So the 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 uh, the virtual learning networks in New Zealand and, and the DISA, the Takura, uh, all of the online schools that we have here in North America, um, those weren't providing remote learning. They were providing online learning throughout the pandemic uh, because they had every intention of, regardless of what was happening with uh, COVID-19 and, and the local epidemiology of, of the, the pandemic, students were going to be online anyway. That was the plan. Uh, whereas in a remote learning, they might be in the classroom one week and then next week, two thirds of the class has tested positive. So we have to move to a distance for a short period of time. But once that's over, we're going to come back to the classroom. And that's more of a remote learning context. OK, so your publications span around about two decades. Can you give us some insight as to the ideas and themes your work has provided, particularly those themes that you sense are still pertinent today? Being one of the early folks in the field, one of the nice things about that was because there hadn't been a lot of work done specifically in this area, I could write about all sorts of aspects from, you know, how do we design online, uh, asynchronous online content specifically for non-adult learners or adolescent learners, yeah. learners that don't have that self-directed, self-regulated nature. How do we deliver and facilitate those, those courses? Um, and how is that different than, say, what we do in, in, in the tertiary environment or in uh, the corporate sector? Uh, how do we prepare teachers to be able to design that content, deliver that content, facilitate that content, um, both in terms of their initial teacher preparation that they would go through as part of their, their university experience, but also professional development that's needed? Uh, how do we prepare students to learn in this environment? Um, what sort of regulatory and policy regimes do we need to put in place to allow for the growth of these programs, but in a way in which that it grows in a, a responsible way? I would say that the vast majority of my work in the first 10 to 15 years focused specifically upon how do we design, deliver, and support online learning for a K-12 audience. Yeah. Um, it sort of shifted uh, about 10 years ago um, while I was still doing a bit of work in, in that area. Um, I really started looking more at the, the, the regulatory and governance structures that were in place. What legislation needs to, to be in place so that these systems can develop in responsible ways mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to some of the, the predatory and profit driven ways we've seen here in North America. And then I guess like most folks, uh, the past two years have been largely focused upon uh, what's been happening in the pandemic. So I can sort of think about it in those kind of three themes, if you will. Yeah. So so broadly speaking, what are the things that actually work in online K-12 education? Are there particular things you could just quickly snatch out, uh, the things that perhaps might be surprising or the things that make the most difference in terms of an effective K-12 online learning experience or system? One of the things that I think is is... I've seen happen a lot, but doesn't happen as much as I would hope. Um, so mm. particularly here in North America, you see a, a lot of these online programs, regardless if they're for-profit or, or not-for-profit programs, they talk a lot about individualized instruction and personalized learning, those types of yeah. things. But the reality of it is, is that they have courses that are designed in, in one manner and they're delivered in one manner and supported in one manner. Mm -hmm. And really the mm -hmm. only individualization is oftentimes the amount of that content you have to cover, depending on what you already know and what you don't know. Yeah. And then the amount of support that you demand of the online program. The ones that I've seen that the, have had real success, and I, and I think this speaks to you know, what we've seen in, in the research is, You'll find oftentimes that a school or a school district or a regional authority 
will look at a specific group of students that aren't being served in the traditional public education system. Yeah. And they'll look at it and say, okay, now what kind of program can we put in place that will allow these students to have success? And, you know, so how do we set up the courses in a way that will allow them to have success? Mm -hmm. How do we deliver those courses? What kinds of supports do those folks need? Uh, what kind of training do both the, 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 the teachers need, but also sort of an orientation for the students? And the answers to those questions will look very different from, you know, student to student. Um, you know, I've seen programs that because of looking at those questions, instead of having students take the four or five courses at a time that, um, you know, a regular student in the classroom would take, um, they'll have the students only focus upon a single course or maybe two courses. And yeah. they'll basically just do that one class. And then once they finish that class, which in theory is going to, should take a quarter or fifth of the, the semester of the year, then they move on to the next one. Online programs where there is some residential component, where students actually have to go to a physical site for certain periods of time, um, and, but having the day for them be look very different than our traditional sort of eight to three or nine to the three uh, school mm -hmm. day. Um, you know, so starting with those questions, I think is is really what we've seen in the research because what that looks like for a you know, a, a child of, of a single parent who has younger siblings that, you know, they've got to work to try to support those or looks very different than from someone who is in an online course because they've already failed, you know, their, their, their grade nine maths twice or three times. And, you know, they're looking mm -hmm. for a different option compared to somebody who is taking an online program because they want to finish their four years of high school in three years. Yeah, yeah. So there's quite a breadth of um, student need out there. I think it's especially when you stop looking at schools as highly structured environments, I guess the online world provides a lot more flexibility and the ability to um, be more accessible to a broader range of students. Definitely. And I, but I, I think the, the one thing that I think online learning can provide that I don't think people talk enough about, but the research certainly bears this out. You, you talk about school being a single structure. Well, if you can envision school being say eight different structures or 10 different structures mm. and depending upon the demographic or individual needs of uh, a group of students you put them into one of these eight or one of these 10 programs um, so that each of the programs are delivered in slightly different ways but they're fairly standardized in terms of for all of the other students so if we could get all of those like students into an environment that's specifically suited for them as opposed to putting all students into you know the one environment or mm. the rhetoric that we have now about making online learning something that is completely individualized to the student because uh, i think that right. in all honesty well I, I use the term rhetoric very specifically around that <laughs> absolutely so michael it's uh, early 2022 um, we've already mentioned COVID. i mean it's, it's hard to get away from what are your observations about online learning and education at the present time, perhaps with a particular focus on the K-12 context? Yeah, so um, I, actually it's interesting. I'm having a conversation with a couple of folks in, in an email thread that, uh, that, that we've been having over the past few days that uh, looks at this idea of where we are now and looking at a lot of the, the media items that are coming out and, and um, one of my colleagues used the term, you know, well, this looks like remote learning, and we know that remote learning has been shown to be quite terrible. And, um, <laughs> you know, we're in our third school year now that's being impacted by the pandemic. While it wasn't totally unforeseen, particularly in some jurisdictions, it was okay that I think, or, or at least acceptable, forgivable, if you will, that some folks got, you know, blindsided by what happened in March of 2020. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, there were some some signs to it and some jurisdictions were a lot better prepared for it than others. But once we got to the 2020 and 21 school years, it, it really started to become inexcusable for school leaders not to prepare for future disruptions. And now that we're into a third school year, um, in all honesty, the school leaders that haven't prepared for what happens if I have to you know, close the school for two or three or four weeks? What happens if 
half of my grade uh, three class or my year nine class are out for the next month? What happens if mm-hmm. um, all of my um, you know, kindergarten or, or year 11 teachers are out sick? We're at a point now where remote learning and, and using that term, I think, is just an excuse to give folks a pass for the fact that they just haven't planned and they haven't looked at what we know about online learning and how to design and develop and support it in effective ways. And, and mm-hmm. um, you know, so as, as I look at where we are now, I, I, I actually have a great deal of disappointment around the current situation and a great deal of uh, well, dread might be too uh, strong a word, but a, a great deal of pessimism, I guess, about what's likely to come in, in you know, post pandemic. You know, because the the reality is, I think a lot of folks haven't had a good experience with distance education uh, over the past couple mm-hmm. of years, and and like I say, while that was excusable right at the beginning, um, we're at the point now where we should be out of excuses if we're being intellectually honest with ourselves. Um, historically, pandemics have tended to happen once to three times a century. Um, you know, we're in 2022 now, and this is the fifth global pandemic we've experienced this century. Um, you know, so the reality is, is that the need to be able to shift the system to some form of, of remote or distance learning for, you know, it could be days, it could be weeks or months, depending upon what it is that's driving the, the disruption. Um, is is going to have to become the default position for um, schools. I mean, the the reality is 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 this is becoming more and more frequent, and it's something that needs to happen. And and even thinking beyond just natural disasters and 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 global pandemics and those types of things, think about just the 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 kid that you know gets. Uh, you know, that, that just falls ill for two or three days. The ability to be able to provide continued learning to them other than just, you know, telling them to read a, a few chapters in the textbook and you'll get caught up mm. when you get back mm. home. More and more, we're seeing folks that, that are involved in a global economy where not only does one of the, the, the parents or both parents, for that matter, have the ability to, you know, do work from really anywhere, um, right now, we're not able to leverage that in the way that we could simply because we've got to keep our kid in a brick and mortar school. Mm, yeah. um, so I, I think the the first thing that we need to do around this is we need to to move off of that um, idea that the classroom is the default. Even if that's where we want the student to be most of the time, I think we need to come to the understanding that, we're going to need more and more of these options, and we're going to have to use them more frequently. There, there's a blogger uh, here in the U.S., uh, a gentleman by the name of Brian Alexander, um, mm-hmm. used the term uh, toggle semester. And he was talking about it from a higher ed context. So the idea was essentially that you could have a student that was in a face-to-face environment uh, you know, on Friday when they left school, and then over the weekend, it was decided that they needed to move to a distance format for Monday and that the quality and level and access to the instruction come Monday was the exact same as it was on Friday when they were in the classroom. You know, For him, that's sort of how he envisioned this toggle semester or this toggle term, the fact that uh, you know, the system, regardless if it was you know, the fact that the kids had devices and had access to that learning and, and the, the educators that were delivering that instruction, regardless if it was in a face-to-face or a distance environment, and even the students, because that's the, the part we often overlook, um, and, you know, they were prepared to know how to learn in either environment. And then the, the aspect that's always completely overlooked is the parents and their ability to help support their kids in this environment. Because mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. you've asked a couple of times about specifically in the K-12 environment. And I think that's actually one of the, the biggest differences between the K-12 environment and other environments is that we have the parents or the family that's a sort of a key player in this. And while most parents have some understanding of what a classroom experience looks like, oftentimes because they you know, sat through it for 13 years, most of them don't have that sort of that that schema 
of what does a, an effective online learning environment look like and, and what's my role in that environment in terms of what I'm supposed to do. So during the pandemic, we've seen parents that have literally sat in on every single lesson that the the teacher has de- delivered when it's been done remotely, particularly mm-hmm. here in North America when we've had a lot of that synchronous instruction that's taken place. So trying to, to make sure that, that we know what they need to be doing and what their responsibilities are, I think, is a, a key aspect in, in, in as we look forward as well. So, Michael, a question I've been really looking forward to, the research you'd most like to see, uh, what gap out there do you think needs to be filled at the moment with a really effective study? When I look at the system right now, I think the biggest deficiency I see um, not just in, in, in the research, but in the practice as well, is how do we really effectively prepare teachers for either of these environments? Um, you know, and, and when we look at teacher education right now, while you can quibble about some of the aspects of it, I think as a society we do a reasonable job at preparing uh, professionals to go into a classroom face-to-face in-person environment mm. and to do a reasonable job in, in that kind of setting. Um, we've really never done well when it comes to how do we add technology to that aspect. Um, and it's not just a, a formatting thing. If you go back to the the 1980s and look at when we first started bringing these technology integration courses into Mm. teacher education, um, you know, there was one of two models that was generally uh, used. The the first was that there was a standalone course often called, you know, integrating technology into teaching or teaching with technology or something like that. And, you know, it was presented as something that was devoid of everything else. So it was completely isolated, completely separated from. And unfortunately, we spent so much time in that class focused upon how to use the technology as opposed to how to teach with the technology or how mm-hmm. to facilitate mm-hmm. learning with that technology. Yeah. Uh, the other model that, that we used back in the 80s was we basically said that, okay, we're going to try to make technology integration pervasive throughout the entire curriculum. Yeah. Uh, but the reality was, and still is, to be perfectly honest with you, that so many university faculty don't feel comfortable with the, the use of technology themselves. So in those mm-hmm. sort of, mm-hmm. you know, let's make – this pervasive throughout the curriculum, it's really a a, a crapshoot, if you will, as to what professor you get uh, in terms of, you know, how much they do that and how apparent they make it or obvious they make it to the students so that it can Mm -hmm. be used as a, a teaching model. And while I said it started back in the 80s, in all honesty, um, if you walk into the vast majority of, of teacher preparation programs really worldwide now, those two models that I just described still exist. You know, yeah. there are still, um, I'm going to say, at least half, probably closer to two thirds of, of university programs that have some kind of, you know, teaching with technology course in them. The other third to a half try to make the argument that they, and, you know, they might not say technology now, they might say that, you know, it's blended learning or online learning or something, you know, digital learning or what have you. They'll use different terminologies for it but that it's included throughout their curriculum. And we're still doing a very bad job at, at, at both. So, uh, and until we can fix that aspect of it, you know, if, if teachers are coming into the system thinking that this is an add-on, thinking that this is something that's isolated, that's oftentimes an elective um, as part of their course, that means that it's not a core part of the system. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that idea of changing that mindset from in-person being the default to, you know, the default being that location is irrelevant and it's the tools that we're using depending upon the location. We've got to, you know, change that mindset first. And then once we change that mindset, then those folks have to have the skills and the knowledge to be able to support the tools that they're using and then understand how to sequence or deliver instruction and facilitate with that with their students um, in an effective way. 
to me, that's the, the key thing. There's always been, I think, a hope, even beginning when these technology integration courses started being uh, adopted in the 80s, that, well, they're only going to need to be short term because the next generation, they'll know how to use technology. And, and you hear the, the same thing now with digital learning, that there's yeah. this myth that, you know, because they have grown up in a society that's pervasive with technology, that somehow they'll know how to use it in effective and efficient ways for learning. Yeah. And seeing that just not bear out generation after generation now, to me, that's the research I'd like to see because we've done a really bad job of this kind of thing now for 40 years. Yeah. So we need to find a better model. Right. And of course, you touched on the myth of the digital native there as well. There's a gentleman by the name of Steve Wheeler that uh, actually he was writing about it in terms of, uh, of learning styles. But I've always thought that in this particular article that I saw of his, if you replace the word learning styles with digital learner or digital native, um, the article still would have hung true. <laughs> Um, yeah, they talked yeah. about it being an inconvenient untruth, yeah, the idea yeah. that, you know, it kind of intuitively makes sense. So most people will agree with it. But when you actually look at it, it you know, it, it doesn't hold water when it comes to the actual reality of the context. Mm. And, uh, yeah, so the, the, the myth of the digital native really has hindered us in that respect. So, Michael, just to close, two people you'd recommend as leaders or legends of online learning, uh, one whose work or perspective is significantly influencing you, and one who you think otherwise has an important perspective to share. Um, well, I, I guess the, the first one I would uh, point to is, is uh, an old colleague of mine, um, actually someone who I still engage with in discussions and email and otherwise uh, on a regular basis, who I know has influenced me a lot, is uh, Ray Rose. Uh, Ray is, uh, he was involved with the creation of the virtual high school uh, that was uh, created back in 96. So it was one of the first online programs in the U.S. That and the Florida Virtual School were part of the first two supplemental programs in the U.S. Uh, he's worked in and out of the academy, but mostly in untraditional roles. Um, spends most of his days these days being a consultant. Uh, and uh, he has a great focus upon special education and, and making sure that distance learning in general is accessible mm -hmm. to all learners. Um, and uh, he also plays the role of provocateur quite well. Um, yeah. So if you're looking for someone to challenge your thinking, uh, Ray is really a, a guy for that. Um, the other one that, that I'd point to is actually a, a newer scholar, someone who I've seen develop um, from being a doctoral student at the Brigham Young University to a faculty member now at George Mason, and that's Jared Borup. Um, and the reason I, I, I recommend Jared is because one of the uh, limitations of the field of distance learning in general, regardless if you know of medium, regardless of K-12 or, or higher ed, is the fact that we haven't had a lot of theory or uh, conceptual frameworks that have really been pervasive in the field. Um, in fact, right. if if you look at it, it wasn't until the the 60s, 70s that we saw even with the broader field of distance education that we saw the development of really any theory. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as it stands right now, there. Up until a couple of years ago, there hadn't been any theory or conceptual frameworks that had specifically focused upon K-12 environment. That changed with uh, Jared's work. He had been sort of doing this line of inquiry and as a part of that work, um, developed this um, academic communities of engagement framework or this ACE framework. The hallmark of a good learning theory is the fact that it isn't context dependent. Yeah. Um, so while it came out of the online learning environment, and I think is very useful in that environment, I think it can also be used in a face-to-face -face setting, both in the K-12 and in, in the adult population. Um, but so Jared Borup at George Mason University would be the second one that I would uh, recommend for that very reason. I'm, I'm always anxious to see what the next development that he's going to have as he works through with this theory. Um, I know they've just rebranded some of the uh, variables and actually even the name academic communities of engagement is uh, new in their latest version. Um, and I know the next step that he wants to be working on is coming up now with an instrument that's designed to measure some of the variables that are in that framework. 
Uh, so it's, mm. it's it's exciting work to see and, and ones that I'm, I'd am i encourage folks to follow because I think it holds great promise for the field. Brilliant. Michael, it's been fantastic catching up. Uh, thank you so much for your time and interview. Uh, thank you for being a leader of online learning. And thank you for the conversation. It's been uh, fun. Thanks, Michael. You can learn more about Michael and his work from our website. That concludes this episode. Be sure to go to our website, www.onlinelearninglegends.com, to follow up on this episode's guest.